Thanks, Pat. Uh, especially for putting this on. It's hard to believe that it's been a year uh, since the last one. Um, I was here last year um, with a panel with uh, Charles Nutter and Tim and John Lamb and <coughs> giving, <coughs> excuse me, basically on an implementation panel talking, kind of doing a Q&A about things. So it's great to be back. Um, so I guess uh, I'm going to talk about a few things today. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of the, you know, where Rubinius is right now. I know that that's a pretty common question, so I thought I'd get that out of the way. But really what I want to focus on for the majority of the talk is not so much that, but the kind of uh, almost the things that I've learned um, kind of heading up that project and um, how the community around the project has um, really made it possible and kind of go, go into that sort of from a, um, this is how I run my project kind of point of view. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have all this time to do any of this work if it weren't for Engineered. So, uh, you know, big, big ups to them for basically providing me with the resources and the time and, you know, the immense vision to believe that, um, you know, this is something that they wanted that, that can be funded full time. So on to status. So um, let me take you <clears throat> back uh, about a year to March 16th, 2007, 2 p.m., there was me. Uh, up on this stage, uh, wearing a soccer jersey on the, with the presenter panel. This is one of the lovely Comp Freaks uh, videos from that, that talk. And, um, you know, a lot has happened in that year since I gave, since I was up talking about what was going on then. You know, then I was talking about how, uh, you know, I, I w didn't have a full-time job doing this. It was still a hobby. And I was talking about how, won't it be great when we can run <laughs> any code at that point. It was uh, very much still, uh, you know, an experiment. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to say that we've really come a long way since then. Well, let's cover what else has happened in the sort of Ruby implementation sphere that encompassed that stage that morning or that afternoon. So, you know, we have, we have JRuby 1.1 or so or whatever they're on at the moment. Um, you know, Ruby CLR has largely been replaced with Iron Ruby. The status of Cardinal remains largely unknown, um, and so you know obviously we want to move on to you know what has happened in the Rubinius world since then. Well, I, you know I'm I'm super happy to say that we've had millions of small victories in the last year. Um, you know there are really too many to account for. You know in a presentation to talk about how oh we managed to get this running or we did this we got these these tests written. Um, the project itself has managed to shore itself up an enormous d degree through very small contributions and has really managed to kind of elevate the completeness and the overall strategy of the, of the project. Um, and of course, as with any large project, we've had thousands of missteps in the last year. I've made, you know, most of those have probably been my mistakes or, you know, just you know, making the wrong assumption and backing out, but um, that's part of having a big project. Um, we've had hundreds of questions about how, how the thing is supposed to work, you know, reevaluating, having, uh, having lo lots of debates about what we're actually trying to accomplish. Um, I've been to tens or dozens of conferences, whatever. Um, but really, we've all been, it's all been in pursuance of one goal, and that is really to build a VM where writing in Ruby is not an afterthought, where every day you come in to build this VM and you're writing in Ruby, and that's A-OK -okay with me. So in that last year, what have we output? Well, really the, one of the biggest things that's come out of it is, is wisdom. Um, and, and I don't mean like, you know, there's, I, I've learned a lot of things, but the whole community, the whole uh, project, the whole community has learned an enormous amount uh, about how to 
not just how to build this project, but also how to function as a very large, very transparent community. Um, we have, you almost never hear about um, the Rubinius core team because I, I kind of frown on that, those, that sort of phraseology because it's, it puts the people that work on Rubinius in two separate camps. It puts them in the, um, I have the keys, I have the power kind of camp and the sort of, you know, the proletariat camp. And that has a, I'm going to kind of go on to show you later on in the presentation how that has really, I think that that is a really dangerous model and, and mindset to get into with the project as you go on. Um, and, you know, I, this is one of the hundreds of questions is, is it done? You know, Mike asked me that this morning, like, uh, how's it going? You know, are we going to get a big announcement here? And, you know, and we all know this, but, you know, I'm learning it again for the first time that, you know, time estimates are hard, you know. But, you know, when you're, when you're highly transparent, everybody knows why, you know, why things are going slow. And, you know, I, I, I get, you know, originally, um, probably I said it on this stage last year, uh, that, oh, well, I want to have a um, 1.0 by RubyConf uh, in November. We were not even half done. I mean, if, if I know what half done is at this point by RubyConf. And um, mainly because one of the things that we've learned over time is what the scope of the project is. You know, we kind of went into this thinking, well, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. And we had a, a feeling for what it might be, but we really have learned over time what that scope is. Um, and we've gotten better about time estimates, so it's still, it's still hard. Um, one of the biggest things to come out of the project so far is this giant test, this giant spec suite. Um, and that's really, um, in the last year, been a big mover and shaker in all of the whole Ruby community in terms of the implementers. Um, you see people like, like JRuby really it runs our, uh, runs the test suite that, or the spec suite that we've been working on to make sure that JRuby is working fine. And we're planning on actually spinning it off as a separate project so that JRuby has, and other implementers have better access to it. Um, you know, at the RubyConf presentation in November, um, uh, John Lamb got up to talk about Iron Ruby and basically showed a, it running the Rubinia specs just you know right up there. He didn't really you know we didn't care we didn't hear about it. He just happened to showed up in a presentation that kind of thing, and being highly transparent and really sort of giving this spec speed, spec suite away has has actually proved pretty great. Um, it has really given a lot of people. Um, things to do and an entryway into the project. Another thing that we've really gained is this idea of continual progress. Um, you know, we make mistakes and we have to go back on our, back on what was going on and, you know, rewind, start over on certain things. But for all in all, the project has continued to move on in an upward trajectory um, for, as a long-term trend, um, which is really the, the whole key of it. You know, and then we have the, the goals that you know, people in this room can actually really kind of, if you're not really, if you've never seen Rubinius and you can't really, you, you don't look at the code, you know, goals that you can get, sink your teeth into, you know, like it runs IRB and it runs Ruby gems. Those are two huge goals that we, you know, have managed to accomplish in the last year um, that are, you know, um, uh, a presentation by John Lamb, he was saying that, like, it's hard giving a presentation about a Ruby VM because all of the things, all of the successes that you have uh, look very paltry from the external world. You know, when I say that, oh, it runs IRB, that took, you know, a year and a half worth of work just to run IRB, right? And, but to the external world, that's sort of like, okay, well, you know, why is that a big deal? So it's, it, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting how, how to, uh, take my word for it, how about that? Yeah. Um, and then Ruby Gems is a fairly new uh, a accomplishment, um, you know, engineer hired uh, Eric Hodel um, just this 
uh, I guess, the end of last year. Um, and he is one of the main RubyGems contributors now and has actually, he, um, he and I work, worked a lot on getting RubyGems integrated nicely into Rubinius. So you can do stuff like uh, Rubinius gem install, that kind of thing. And, um, and that, uh, you know, I'm really happy to say that that is working uh, very well right now. Um, it's still got bugs here and there, but you know, we've been able to do things like install, install gems and run, run stuff directly out of gems and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going, I, I don't have a ton of slides for this talk, um, and looking at my time, I, what I wanted to say real fast was, you know, if you have questions, um, typically what I like to do is go ahead and just raise your hand and we'll kind of go off on a tangent um, right there, and, and I'll kind of have to rein it back in if I feel like the tangent is going too long, but hopefully, uh, you know, if I'm, not, I'm not boring you up here. Um, so, <coughs> um, so moving a little bit on to community next, um, I've learned that The one thing that I've really learned in terms of like Ruby, um, the Ruby community and sort of the Ruby ecosystem is that um, this, which is now considered, uh, I think it's officially an adage that the Ruby community people are very nice. Um, I think it's gone around long enough. It, soon it will be myth, actually. So that's the next level after adage, I think. So we're currently at adage. So um, this, it, it, it's really proved to be very true. Um, that the community is fairly small, but very um, excitable, um, which for the most part in terms of a community is a very good thing. Um, and there, you know, we find, if you look at other communities, you'll see that either because of, you know, market forces or internal um, community interactions, that they become very cynical about new ideas and new things. And the, one of the greatest things about the, the Ruby community in general is that it's been very open and very um, embracing of new ideas. Um, you know, a good example is that in the last, in the last year, we've seen this huge up upturn in like Ruby projects using things like Git or uh, Mercurial, that's those sorts of things. Things that in other communities tend to take a long time for the vast majority of people to, to take off with them. They're very slow for, to adopt in the wider community sense. But in the Ruby community, you see that like, you know, it happens at a very quick pace and people are very eager to jump on and eager to move it forward. And I think that in terms of the community is something that um, if you have a project and you're looking to get people in, you really want to capitalize on. You really want to use the excitement of the community to your benefit. Um, and you know, sort of to that end, um, it, it's important to realize that um, just like uh, you have a project, and I have a big project, Rubinius, but I am not, I, I am not Rubinius anymore. I mean, the, a, few year, a few years ago, I could probably make that claim, but it's actually not, I mean, it's not mine anymore. At the moment, I'm steering the ship, but it is moving under its own power um, because of the community that has sort of risen up around it and risen up in terms of the whole Ruby community in general. Um, even just not in, in terms of people who um, are actually contributing code every day and really watching the project closely, but in terms of this idea that the Ruby community is really embracing of these new ideas. And so I, I can float this out pretty easily and you know, get people excited. And really, they, the whole community tends to kind of embrace that and, and is able to run with it. And so sort of, that's a re that was a really big goal in the last year that I realized that um, even if, that I wasn't really the momentum for the project anymore, that the momentum is actually taken out of my hands and now it's, I'm actually riding with the wave of the project now. 
And that's really because you know, the whole Ruby community is now the Rubinius community. They, for the most part, merged for the most part. They have, further, they have merged. Um, they were fairly segmented. There was people who were working on Rubinius that were in the Ruby community. But now you, I, I get enough interaction from sort of people who have just a really passing knowledge of the project. They say like, oh look, hey look, it looks great. I'd love to, you know, I can't wait till it gets to 1.0. And that really tells me that it's, it's grown now to this point where now it's the same community. They're no longer separate. They're uh, no longer one is a superset of the other. It's, it, it's finally kind of um, encompassed both. And that's a huge thing, um, which kind of, you know, moves me on to my big next section here of talking about community. You know, that, that famous Apple guy said that if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna revise that a little bit today. Um, you know, I want to make up a new one here. If we have seen further, it's because we built an awesome treehouse. Sort of like this. <laughs> And it's really because we have made that decision as a community to push, uh, to get together and to build this thing up from sticks and mud and lacquer, it looks like. But the big thing is that you really can't buy a community. I mean, if you have a big project out there and you're trying to rally people behind it, um, it doesn't, it's very hard to do that in an inorganic way. It's hard, you can't really go out and, um, you know, other, it's happened in the past where companies have tried to grow these communities. They start a website, you know, they get some, they get some street people, you know, handing out swag, that kind of thing. And they try and really buy a community through um, kind of not really excitement. And you find that almost universally those, those communities fail. So what I'm going to talk about next is sort of a set of bullet points that I've put together that talk about what I feel are the real big points that have made this Rubinius community really quite amazing. And that first one is that these are sort of from a project management's point of view. That first one is that there really is no task is too small. You know, um, early on when we were writing um, specs and we were taking we were starting to take contributions from people, which is about a year ago, um, there was this feeling that um, oh well, you know, yeah, we'll get we'll get contributions from a few people, but the, you know, there'll be one line specs here and there. But those one line specs are. Uh, Fish, I mean, I could probably write a paper to show that the one-line spec is officially a gateway drug because we have seen an enormous amount of people who they write the one-line spec, they, you know, they, they come in, they realize they're like, oh, well, it's, you know, array has got such and such behavior that is really trivial, really, I'll just write a one-line spec to test that edge case, no problem. And they write that one. And we have we've put the barrier so low in terms of contribution that uh, we'll ta we take one line documentation changes as valid, as valid patches to get a commit right, to get commit rights to the project. Um, so I, there's, no, there's no bottom in terms of the size of that task that the person can actually um, perform. And the reason for that is that will never be, if you make, if you, let, if you open that door for them, even though it's this tiny little mouse store, if it's very easy for them, they'll go through and they'll do something else. They'll go to the next level. They'll say, oh, okay, well, that was so, that was so simple. You know, I did it in an afternoon, and it was this one line. I've got a few more hours here and there. Let's see, oh, okay, you know, the next one, it's, you know, now I got a 10-line one, you know, and then they get a little more excited. They're like, oh, this is so easy, it's so much fun. Then they do a 100-line one. And the ramp up for that is just, it's amazing to see what opening that door for anybody who wants to walk through it is able to do. And really that's because, like I was saying, every contributor has worth. There is, 
even if you, how do I put this? Um, there are personalities that will grade on you. And there are personalities of people in the community that maybe you're not so fond of. But what you'll find is that if you go ahead and you kind of put your personal feelings aside and you say like, you know, even, you know, even the, 15, the annoying 15 year old who wants to come in and he's super excited and he produces a lot of noise and a one line patch, that's still a contribution because it has grown the community, even if it's not in terms of that, even if that one line patch is all they do and they disappear, they might tell their friends or they might um, create some buzz. You have no idea where those, the, that next sort of star contributor will come from. And it's, um, you, you, you need to foster Every, everybody who comes to that door is um, someone that you should talk to. <coughs> and that same way I've kind of gone over this, that every contribution has its worth. You know, one line documentation changes are great. And, you know, lots of, you know, we have had a significant number of contributions, some of them mine, that have really proved what not to do. Um, you know, we have, in that same vein, a policy, for the most part, of asking for forgiveness rather than permission. And this idea that if you have, you submit that one line documentation change and you get that, you get commit rights, and you decide, you know what, I've got, I, I get a hair up my ass and I wanna go rewrite some big section and you go and it breaks a bunch of things. You know, that's, honestly, that's not big, that big a deal. We can always go back and we can always revert that commit and say like, hey, you know, that was a great try. What were you trying to accomplish? And really, you can go forward from there and proving that, okay, well, we tried that approach. It didn't work. What can, how can we move forward from here? And so a big part of that is this idea that debate is healthy. And every project will have friction, no matter what. This idea that you will, you're able to get a very small, close-knit team of people who all have the same mindset and who all are striving towards the same goal and that those are the people who you want to be the, the say, the quote-unquote core contributors is uh, pretty much a blatant fallacy because even amongst those core people, there will be dissent. And if the... At, sort of as the project leader, if you don't foster that debate as a healthy part of the development process, you will uh, easily begin to grow animosity amongst either the core team or um, you know, the external contributors. But if you say, you know what, I, you know, I can be wrong here and you can accept you know, that uh, an open discussion about what should be done, and that nothing is sacred, that there's no sacred cows in the room, that you can really put everything on the table and have a really honest discussion, <laughs> that that does amazing things for the, um, the sort of the lifeline of the project and the quality of, of conversation that occurs in the project. Because as a project manager, there's this there's this big tendency to really see, especially in the beginning, where in the same way that say you have a startup company and you're working towards, you are working towards some goal with your project, you tend to, you tend to start to mix the two, you and the project. And it's very, it's very easy to do. It, you know, and I'm more than guilty of doing this as well. But, you have to, at the end of the day, when you sit down and you're not working on the project anymore, you have to remember that you are not your project. No matter what you may feel about the project, no matter how, uh, how excited you are about it, no matter how, um, you know, how good it makes you feel, you are not it. It has to have a life of its own that is actually separate from you in order in order to grow properly. And really, I'm talking to you because there are, it's very easy to fall into this ego trap that you start a project and it starts to take off and you see like, wow, this is great, this is all me. 
right? And maybe you're not thinking that. Maybe you're not that. You, you tend to, you know, in, in the morning you look at yourself and you go, like, I'm not an egotistical guy, right? But it's so easy to fall into that ego trap of when someone breaks the project, you go, they're hurting me. They stab me in the chest. You know, or when bad press, press comes out about your project or when someone dogs it, you tend to see it as a personal attack rather than a open, an opening for how to move the project forward in a different direction. Because if you, if you separate your own personal ego from the project, amazing things tend to happen. Because when someone attacks you, you're able to say, oh, okay, well, that's a good point. Why do we think that? And how should we change it going forward? If, if the person has, I mean, there's, there's plenty of people out there who have good points, which brings me to my next, <coughs> my next bullet point here, which is that you're not always right. And the corollary here is that it's actually very important to be wrong in public. When you have that healthy debate to a project, You, and, and you've distanced yourself a little bit ego-wise from the project, and you've started to let that project live, it's very important. And this sometimes doesn't come naturally, sometimes it does. But it's important to realize that your decisions up front are, you may think that they're done with the best intentions and that you have the best kernel of information to make a change or to make an architectural decision. But by and large, you're not going to always be right. And I've been wrong tons of times. And, but when you're wrong, don't, don't go behind closed doors and talk to the person who called you out. And don't tell them, oh, you know what? I, you know, don't kind of weasel your way out of it. Don't say, oh, well, I've seen your point of view and, or, you know, or, uh, oh, I tried that before, and I, I guess I missed something. Don't turn it on you. Don't make it all about you still. And don't do it behind closed doors. Do it out in the open. Do it in, on the mailing list. Do it on the IRC channel. Do it wherever you know that the other people live. And be ready to admit to say, like, you know what? I fucked up. And we're going to go in this direction, and then, you know, this is, my, this is my idea for why I think that we should move forward doing this other thing. Because if you're ready to go out and you're ready to put your, put it all out there to say that, you know, you as someone, you know, typically as a project leader, people look up to that you have made a mistake and that you want to move forward, that does an amazing thing for fostering the rest of the community for saying like, oh, okay, great. So he is open to new things. And that, you know, the next time someone comes around and they say, you have a healthy debate, and let's say the idea is totally stupid, right? Because that happens a lot. We, you ha you'll, ha you'll start into a debate with someone about an idea where they're like, hey, how about this, this, and this? And you realize fairly early in this debate that really there's no way getting around it. This is a ridiculous idea. But that if you have fostered this idea that you can be wrong, when you shoot them down, they're like, oh, okay, well, thanks for listening. I guess, I, you know, I guess you know, maybe we'll talk about it later. You go, okay, great, we'll talk about it later. Because you've, told, you've showed them that you're taking, their, you're taking their idea to heart and that you're actually giving it some credence. And that is a really, you know, I guess I can't stress it enough that that does just, it puts this sense in the mind of the other people in the community that you're there listening to them and that as you make changes and that as you make decisions for your project, it's not you making them by yourself. And so as that community grows, and I talked about this earlier, about th this idea of core contributors. The idea that there are keys to the castle, I'm going to put forth as a myth. And if you have an open source project, there is no such thing as keys to your open source project because you, by default, have left the front door open. 
right? So yeah, there's keys, but who's using the keys at this point? They're all walking through that open front door. And so there's really no reason to bolt down and to really carve out these tiny niche of people that you feel or that you have sort of elected to be your main, your, you know, your main contributors. Because what's gonna happen is if you make it very difficult to be in that inner echelon, there's gonna be external work that's done that you're not able to, that you're not able to uh, get access to. Because as an open source project, you've already, you're already giving it away. And people externally are gonna be, um, they're gonna be doing work on it whether or not you like it or not. And if you're not willing to show people that you're open to taking contributions from anybody and anywhere, um, it, it tends to foster a us and them mentality over time that can prove to be the death of many projects. And there's a numerous projects that go through their lifetime as you know, a, a, a tiny commit team of five people where they're very selective about what they decide to take in and they're very closed. And over time, that community withers. And it could be just because those five people decide, you know what, I got better things to do. You know, they get jobs, they get whatever. Because typically, people don't, aren't working on open source as their only source of revenue. And if, you, if you've already closed it down too much, then the minute those five people go away and the minute you've established it at very much as this closed thing, it becomes the project very, very quickly begins to rot. But if you have left the door open and you have invited as many people in as, as you can and you've said everybody has value and every contribution has value, then over time, as those people tend to check out because they you know, they have, they have normal everyday lives. You know, they're not sitting at their computer 24 seven. As they leave, you've left it open so wide that you get more people come in. And yeah, you get a lot of people who come in and they say like, you guys suck, and then they leave. Or they come in and they give you one contribution and they, that's all you ever hear about them. And that's fine, because they've still contributed in some way. Um, you know, the, the guys who show up and say you suck typically have contributed in that they've made the community, they've given the community armor, right? They're, they are the, the nasty external virus-ridden world to the community's immune system. That they have come and they have said, you know, I think you guys are really doing a ridiculous thing. And that fosters debate inside the community to say like, okay, well, what do we think about this? Do we really think we're doing something ridiculous? How should we go forward? You know, should we make a response? You know, and that the ideas and the philosophies of the project tend to get built up over time better if you're more open to those sorts of things. So the next point is to foster experimentation. With a large group um, of contributors, this is fairly easy. This happens without you asking for it um, because people get, have a lot of different interests as you get a large group. But by and large, you should very rarely say, no, don't do that now. Um, it now is not the time, or um, I don't think we're prepared for X, Y, and Z. You can certainly say, especially if you have any kind of um, control over the person's time, you can say, well, that's a good idea, but your time is better spent doing something else. But if you have someone that comes in and says, hey, you know what, uh, you know, we, we've had, uh, you know, I have one guy in particular who who showed up and said, I'm really interested in LLVM, which is a kind of new, um, sort of like a, it's a new, very low level VM that generates machine code directly. That's actually not important for this uh, example. But, you know, he came in and he said, I'm really interested in LLVM. And Rubinius seems like fun. It seems like you guys are having a lot of fun in this community. Um, I want to do something with Rubinius and LLVM. Why not say sure? Why not say, go, you know, have a good time, knock yourself out. 
you know, and provide that person with as many pointers as you can. You know, those are the outlandish ones. Those are the ones that a lot of times uh, the person doesn't know what they're getting into. You know, maybe a week later they show up and say like, wow, that shit's hard. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, you know? That's okay, you know? Because the that shit's hard mentality is good for everybody else because the next person who comes along and said, wow, you know, this guy said that was hard. So if I approach that, I'm gonna approach that with that knowledge now. Um, but you also get this idea of say, um, you know, we've got people who, um, you know, a good, uh, another kind of good example of this is Rubinius, the kernel of Rubinius being all written in Ruby is actually really great for experimentation because we get people who show up and say like, you know what, um, I really think that the way that string operates at the very lowest level is you know, not, real, not real great and I wanna write an entirely new string class. And you go, yeah, sure, absolutely, you know, go for it. What, point, what, what can we provide you? What information do you need to begin? And really to, you know, to let every form, every expression of a person's creativity be, uh, be a valid expression. Never, the idea that you would say, that someone would show up and say, um, oh, well, you know, like, I think reading this would be really awesome if it had this feature. And that the last thing, the worst thing that you can do to that person is to say, well, well, no one wants that feature. That's a ridiculous idea. That's the, the last thing and the worst thing that you can say to that person. Because there are so many things that come out of experimentation other than the intended result. The idea that this person could start to experiment, they could get halfway through and they could get, get, they could get to the, this shit's hard stage. But they could realize along the way, wow, look at all these other things. Look at, look at, look at this, look at this, look at this. I'd love to work on this. And maybe that, those other points of experimentation have very real end results. And so you get an enormous amount of work from people by just letting them kind of play, letting their mind wander. It's almost like free association, but with code, right? You let them go down these really long, you know, really long paths, and they may never get there, but along the way, they could discover amazing things that they want to work on, or amazing things that the project can benefit from. And by fostering that, that experimentation, it leads to, sort of a second, sort of the next stage of this, well, they're related, which is that excitement really is contagious. Um, and that you, as a project leader, you have to lead by example in being excited about things. And that, what I mean here is that if you get people excited about your project, um, it's almost impossible to, uh, to use a cliche, to contain someone's excitement. It's almost impossible to, con to contain that excitement about a project for that person because invariably they tell their friends. They're hanging out and they say like, hey, you know, I'm working on this awesome thing. Look, this, look at this code that I wrote. And that builds out your community. And then that same way, by fostering experimentation, you foster this idea of being creative. And uh, I am um, I'm a terrible math student. Um, I had to take linear algebra like three times in college just to get a C. But, and so I kind of consider myself that more, that m kind of more creative, like abstract-minded programmer. Not so concerned with the algorithms and the math of what goes on, but in the overall construction and the overall beauty of the thing that, that gets accomplished. And it's very hard to, um, to express and to sort of, um, to put a finger on what is creativity and why people get excited about it. But you can easily see that, you know, if you, if you kind of look at the, like, take painters today. Experimentation in painting is the number one thing that is encouraged. And that, the, this idea that people should, um, you know, learn from the masters and then begin to experiment with what they've learned and go off and do their own thing, fosters this excitement in their art and they become very creative and then they begin to give back to their internal communities. But they get, they're excited because they have all these avenues and all these, 
um, openings to continue forward. And so if you can make everything, if you can make your project excitable, if you can make your, if you can, if you can make it fun, I mean, if you can never say to someone no, um, you, if you can say to someone maybe not now, one, occasionally, or that didn't work, you know, we try again, that's okay. But you're really able to, if you can get that ball rolling in terms of excitement, then um, things will really, really start to spiral. So that is actually where my slides end. So um, in terms of time, I'm, uh, I guess, we could do a number of different things here. Um, I can open it up for questions if there are, it's pretty early for questions, so uh, do we have questions? Otherwise, we can kind of go from there. Okay, all right. We, we can talk about, we can do questions for hours. So, okay, so let's do right here. I was just wondering, I've, I've never heard of Rubinius before right now. I was wondering if you could just kind of give a brief overview of what it is. Sure. So. Um, uh, uh, he asked if I could give a real brief overview of what Rubinius is. So the idea behind Rubinius was um, to build a new Ruby uh, virtual machine where as much of it was written in Ruby as possible. And um, for the most part, that means that kernel of code that is available um, when the whole machine, when the VM first boots up. So what I mean by that is, so say array and all the methods on array and string, all the methods on string, all those sorts of things. In Rubinius, all of those are all written directly in Ruby. And um, the idea is to really drive forward this idea that um, a Ruby VM doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be written in some of the language. You know, when we see like um, the current Ruby is written 100% in C. There's actually no Ruby Ironically, there's no Ruby in Ruby. Uh, it's all written in C. Um, in the case of JRuby, it's all written in Java. In the case of Iron Ruby, it's all written in C Sharp. So this idea that um, those are great, but I don't really like writing in those languages. I really like writing in Ruby. So how can we foster that idea of writing as much in Ruby as you can? So that's the goal, um, is, to, is to, to build that VM. And in the course of building that VM, to build it with unique features, and you know performance and all that kind of things that other VMs don't have. Um, so that's the brief overview. So, yes. Um, you talk about um, fostering yeah. And I agree with that. But I'm wondering how you handle a situation where somebody does have an idea that doesn't really fit with a project, and it would take a project in a poor direction. Um, and is that, that person willing to take it all away? You see what I'm saying? It's, it's obvious when they get halfway through and they're like, oh, I, I understand now why this doesn't work with the project and this doesn't fit the direction. But, you know, if somebody turns into a video and somebody just decided they wanted to add some strange method to a simple class, um, and the rest of the community wouldn't consider that a good direction, how do you handle it? Um, well, I think the first thing is, did you say a poor direction? <laughs> did you use word, the word poor? I, I did, but I did. So the first thing is to not put a value judgment on it, right? Because it can certainly not be the direction that the you or the community that you have has decided is a valid one. There can certainly still be a direction. Um, and the problem, and, and, and you know, I, you know I'm, I do rewrites all the time. And I kind of, you know, you, whenever you do a rewrite of something, you kind of consider the fact that uh, you fucked up the direction originally, right? Because if you went down this way and you thought, you know, this is really, this is the way, this is the thing right here, and then after a while you're like, you know what, never mind, I screwed that up, and you went go down some other direction, uh, that you've basically done what this other person is doing, just it's now, it's now extra body instead of intra body, right? So it's, in terms of what you would do, okay, so say that um, ad adding a new method to symbol is actually fairly benign. Let's take a, a bigger one. Like let's say that someone wants to 
take Ruby and they want to add innumerable features to the VM and they actually want to customize the whole kernel to be something completely different, to be act not, no longer in any way, shape, or form, like say that all the classes are named different, all the methods are named different, it has completely different functionality. So the idea of what, what do you do when that happens? Well, um, I would say you slap the guy on the back and you say, have a good time. And there's really, what, The, you know, all of these points that I've given can't be taken individually. They have to be taken as a larger strategy for how to manage a project, right? So that if you've got the other things, if you've got open debate, then it's easy, or it's, well, it's easier to over time to say to this person who's, say, forked your project and has taken it in a completely different direction, to say like, you know what, um, you know, we could talk about this all day, but it seems like you want to take it in this direction and I want to take it in this direction. And there are certain points where we meet up, right? So how can we move forward? And if, you know, maybe you, 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 you wish him luck in his new project. You say, you know, maybe you suggest a new name for the project for him. You know? uh, start calling it X, Y, and Z thing, FUBAR, whatever, instead of you know, to differentiate them. And you, you tell people, hey, there's this new project out there. Someone forked my thing and they're working on this. If you're interested, go check it out. If you quell those things, if you stamp them out as soon as they show up, <coughs> then what will happen is that those people will say, wow, they're not very open to this debate idea, right? But if you, I mean, there are so many different ways it can go in the end if you let this person run with their idea, right? I think we're all naturally, humans are naturally risk averse. And this idea that someone has taken your thing and has taken it in a different direction than maybe you see is a big risk. And, but the number of question marks that are down that road are really too, I mean, there's just, you can't hypothesize what could happen. Any number of, like, they could go down that road and it could turn into nothing. They could go down that road and it could actually turn into something much bigger than your own project. But if you, at the beginning, if you foster that experimentation and if you tell that person, absolutely, let's figure out how to contribute. If you want to do this thing, that doesn't really meet up with us, but let's figure out how we can remain a community in the larger sense. Then if their thing takes off and maybe yours doesn't, so what? You, you are still one community then. You can, you know, maybe you decide, you know what? He was right. Maybe it takes you a year to realize that like, wow, you know, Nokia bought his company. Obviously he did something right, you know? So, you know, if you have been friendly to him and if he is your confidant and is in your community, then that year later, you're gonna be really happy that you fostered that experimentation. And after all, you shouldn't, um, He provide. I mean, the, so we get into you get into philosophy. The farther you go down this road, this idea of like, should you hamper the further the furthering of human knowledge, right? So he has provided some body of work that was previously unavailable, and is it your place actually to even tell him that no, he shouldn't be doing that? Um, you know. He probably looks up to you if he's forking your project, that kind of thing. And you certainly have control over his view of what his work might be. But there's really no, there's no downside to letting him run as fast and as far with a project as he wants to. You, I mean, the, this idea that the community will fork and splinter over time because there are forks, <coughs> I think, you know, and, and that's certainly happened with open source projects over time that, you know, they, they but if you go back and you look at the, the seed of that splintering in the community, you'll find, I think, by and large, that where the fork took place, there was a personal attack or a per, someone took something very personal on them and not as something larger to the project and that now they have, um, it's not a technical problem anymore, they have a personal problem with some other person. And that that becomes the fracturing of the community and the fracturing overall. Whereas, you know, it's just software, man. 
you know, free love, you know, whatever. It's just, there's no reason that those things can't continue to exist and grow organically and that you can't, on a human, personal level, let that occur. You know, who knows what might come out of it? So I guess that's my long-winded answer. Sure. Tom? Um, I was just going to say that without distributed version control, I think the risk there to split in the community is a much more significant issue. Um, with Git and Rubinius gaming Git, you know, fork's not a dirty word in Git, right? Every code is a fork. So um, as they continue to develop and you know, do some crazy new version of Rubinius that isn't even Ruby, um, they can still find bugs in the VM, and you can take those patches around, right? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they don't have to be competitive at all. Yeah. There are okay. there's more of like a subversion mindset where if they're if they're going for it, it's fine. But if they're also going to you know bridge it back you know, into the main repository, how do you like keep control? But if it is something like yes, yeah. so that's yeah. right. I mean, it's, it's, I mean the, the most beautiful example of that I think is uh, you know the Anthropomorph and Branch and Lens. Uh, well, you know, I mean these are totally. <laughs> You, gotta, you bring your chair down. Your presentation um, is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Um, so I guess the, the, the idea, this is a good point. This is certainly, thank you for bringing it up because I didn't really talk about it much because I was talking about the more uh, technical. So <laughs> whenever you've worked in a company, there's always the cheap technical fix, right? There's always that like, ridiculous way of solving some personal problem, right? And th this tends to be the other way around, which is that um, the idea that like your, your project might fork and splinter over time tends to, be, uh, tends to be viewed through the lens of this is gonna be very hard technically. And thankfully, uh, software has now, in software we've developed like you new know, techniques for dealing with massively um, distributed, massively forked um, architectures, right? But even in terms of subversion, you could easily do this. It all depends on you, the project leader, the guy who has, the guy who adds subversion commit bits to say, you know what? I think you're doing an amazing thing. I love this fork. I want you, can you move your thing into my subversion repository? I want to host it too. And that's saying like, you know, why do we have to be separate? You want to do your own thing? We share a lot. Why not, why not, I'll give you hosting, you know? I'll, I'll, I'll pony up and I'll let you do it inside. And then over time, you know, maybe you realize, you know, maybe you get to that point where they're like, okay, well, uh, I need this functionality that's tied up in here. And so then you begin to work as a community to refactor over time. And who knows what may come out of that? You may, you may turn into, the project may begin to grow these nice modular architectural organic pieces where now, because you had the opportunity to splinter a little bit, to fork a little bit, now you've been able to focus and say like, oh, okay, well, great. You know, we actually have this really awesome little sub thing here that we could both share. Let's get that done. Okay, sweet, you know, we've got that. And by, you know, the, this idea that you, you know, that it's not really a technical problem uh, from, from that, at least from my point of view, so. Yes. How do you decide and handle what goes into the main code? <coughs> um, how do I, or how do how do how the, how does your music sure work? yeah um, you um, y you have to have a debate about it. You have to. I mean, your project has to be a republic, right? And that you know there are certainly there are ideas for laws that never get passed and all kinds of things that happen all the time. That but by having a debate about whether or not those things are are useful for this stated goal and this stated direction, you're able to judge as in a debate setting whether or not those contributions fall within that realm. And you know we've the. You know, to you know, to look at government, you know, we have, you know, that's why we have a judiciary to debate whether or not they feel that certain things fall underneath the, you know, the stated premise. You know, like the Supreme Court, you know, basically judges whether or not things fall underneath constitutional guidelines. 
you know? And so they, in a debate setting, have that. They're very closed, obviously. You know, it's a very hard process to become a Supreme Court judge. It's very easy to become a Rubinius committer, right? Um, <laughs> Scalia maybe wants to be a Rubinius committer. I don't know. I'll have to call him up. Um, no? No uh, Supreme Court humor? Okay. Um, <laughs> So I guess you have to just take it piece at a time, you know? Um, someone come in, some, someone has a contribution and you look at it and you say like, you know, um, this is good, but I'm not really sure, like, where are you taking this? Because, you know, this doesn't really fit in with our goal. And maybe at the first, maybe at the outset, um, it, it feels like it doesn't fit in with the goal. You talk to the guy, you have a little one-on-one -on -one discussion or you have a round table discussion with the person and you realize actually, no, it does fit in with the goal and you just, Maybe you didn't see it at first, right? Or uh, maybe you decide that no, it really does not fit in with the goal and you'd basically tell the person, you know, this is a really, I, I see where you're going with this and it's an interesting idea but it just doesn't, it doesn't fall underneath the realm of where we are right now. Uh, right now. And that person can do any number of things. They can decide to go off and do their own thing, to take those, those patches that they're, that they're doing and kind of take them in a different direction. But you should still keep that person in your community. You should say like, you know, um, you know, there's no reason that they can't have a separate goal and be going on a separate direction and still remain part of the larger, the larger pie. Yes, behind you. Uh, can you give us some great insights on what it's like to run a, an open source project and, and stuff and experiences? I'm wondering if you could also focus a little bit on, you know, dealing with the larger Ruby community and how like how we're facing stuff. You know, there's a lot of debate about Rubinius will be in one nine and be two zero. Sure. You know, how's that? Been? Um, okay, so the question was, um, how does the how is the larger like sort of Ruby community seen Rubinius in, by and large? Um, well, I guess let me I'll preface that this with a question that I get fairly often, which is, oh, okay, is Rubinius going to be Ruby 2.0, or is it going to be the next Ruby that we're all using day to day? And my answer is unequivocally, that's not up to me. Um, I mean, I'm working on this project and I want to make it the best project that I think I can make it. But by and large, this is a, a very, um, I'm sure there is a gov another government term here, but it's a very loose-knit group of people who, for the most part, uh, you know, decide to use technology based on their own feelings, right? So I can't, I mean, I'm not going to, there's, no, there's not going to be a uh, you know, Rubinius media blitz, you know? There's no, not going to be any Rubinius swag to try and get people to use it, you know? It's not, it's not a car. It's not a, you know, it's, it's not a toaster, right? It's not an air conditioner. Um, it's a piece of thing, it's a piece of code that I'm giving away for free anyway, right? Um, so the point of, my point of view is that the way that I can make it the best and the way that I can fulfill, I mean, I, certainly I have a personal goal to see that uh, Rubinius succeeds and that people really love it and they use it day to day and it really grows and it becomes this awesome thing Just as a personal goal. Sure, you know, we all have personal goals that don't necessarily, that aren't the project goals, right? And so from my point of view, the better I can make the community, the Rubinius community, the better I can make this idea that people will want to use Rubinius. And that, like I said earlier, that this idea that the Rubinius community has now basically expanded to encompass all Ruby programmers. Even if they are hearing about Rubinius for the first time, it's grown now to this point where it's, it's not really a separate idea anymore. And that's really the, that's the way that, that I've always wanted it to be that now it becomes this, um, this tool, this place, you know, that people are think about it and they decide, hey, you know, it got to, you know, when we get to 1.0, people are like, okay, great, I'll download it, I'll check it out, you know, you know. I have to, it being free, I almost have to give people reasons not to want to use it, right? I mean, because there's no, I have to be an asshole. I have to be that guy, you know, who's, who you know, won't add things. I have to make it bad in order for people not to use it almost. Because again, it's not, there's no overhead for someone to decide to use it. So um, in terms of, so that's, that's the first part. <laughs> um, 
In terms of how it's seen in a larger community sense, like how the, the larger Ruby community looks in on the work that's being done on Rubinius, it's for the most part one of um, anticipation. Um, the, what I get a lot um, is oh, uh, you know, people trying to like kind of stir things up a little bit, like, oh, what do you, what do you think about JRuby? You know, do you think it sucks? You know, or, or yeah, well, one nine's a piece of shit. You know, like I can't wait for Rubinius. You know, like they make those, you know, those larger statements. You know, whether or not I, I'm not going to qualify those in any way, shape, or form. But the point for the the Ruby community that they I, I suggest every whenever they bring that up that they realize is that the that competition is the healthiest thing. That, it, that the larger community can have right now. Um, by having multiple VMs, by having multiple projects, by moving things forward in multiple directions, in the same way that you, know, you may fork a project and move it, and move it forward, and it will move forward in ways you never envisioned, by having all of those different pieces all moving simultaneously, and there being enough Ruby programmers for everybody. I mean, again, even if, um, Ru if we all succeed, if JRuby is awesome, and IronRuby is awesome, and Rubinius is awesome, and Yarv is awesome, there's really no, as long as we have some agreed upon conventions, that's what Rubinius is trying to do with the spec suite, there's really no reason we can't all play in the same pool. You know, there's, not, there's no limited resource of Ruby programmers. And by having all of those options, that only grows the number of Ruby programmers more because now they can see you know, uh, JRuby is bringing Java people in. Iron Ruby is bringing C Sharp people in. Um, uh, Rubinius has brought like some small talk people in, um, and that it starts to glom on. And by having all of these healthy projects within the community, that makes the whole community, the whole Rubini or the whole Ruby community, healthier. So, um, let's see. I think like what two more questions time wise. So, um, I'm not probably hippie, I totally buy everything you're saying, but I do kind of have a devil's advocate question. Mm -hmm. I do think, yeah, the decentralized kid approach is the bizarre approach and sort of the singularity of uh, open source, if you will. But, and contributing to Merv, for example, is much easier. I still got my patches into Merv back channel wise. Um, I'm curious, kind of, what you thought I'm saying. Obviously, Linux is a huge project that you can get. But, uh, Maybe there's a little Pollyanna in that you have such a small, self-selected, like, leading edge group that people at a small Ruby comp haven't heard of a project yet. Does that maybe give a different view on how this grows? I think you actually have thoughts on how this does grow, but I kind of want to hear your thoughts on, oh, hey, this doesn't scale when your project gets so big that you get flooded with health vampires and you can't keep up with patches. Sure. So the question is, um, what happens as the the like number of commuters grows, you know, begins to grow, you know, exponentially, and um, you know what, you know, could this devolve into a troll soup, if you will, you know, where no one can get anything done because all they deal with every day is these ridiculous people showing up with contributions. That would be awesome if every day I had 500 people sending in patches because they were like, oh, this is awesome, and they sent in their most ridiculous patches. That would be the coolest thing ever because this is not a, I, I mean, absolutely. The current um, technical, a little bit technical, but mostly human architecture that we have for the project where, you know, we have uh, a, for the most part, a certain number of people typically that review those patches and the review initial patches for people and submit them and we get commit bits and the amount of uh, like daily eyes and review that goes on when, you know, when someone, like when a new contributor um, commits code, um, there's about, I don't know, there's probably 10 or so people that read the commit logs. Um, and when they see, like especially, and I do this, whenever I see a commit by a brand new person, I read, their, I read the diff for their first few commits to check it out, to see what they were up to, right? Um, that doesn't scale if we've got 500 people and they're doing, and, you know, 500 people a day and they all do a commit that day. I'm just, I mean, that, 
that's sort of game over in terms of my free time. So we have to grow the architecture at that point. But what that is, I, I can't say. I mean, that has to grow as an organic byproduct of the demand. I mean, I could certainly up front do uh, you know UML diagram of what it would look like, but we all know that those upfront UML diagrams largely become irrelevant when you actually get to dealing with the problem because you fucked up halfway through. You forgot that, oh, well, there's all these people in France and they're eight hours off of you. And what are you gonna do now? You know, that kind of thing. So what you know, I, I guess I, I mean I'm not Maybe the growing your community so openly as you say it will it will continue with its scales to open yeah, I mean, select itself and mo moderate itself. Yeah, I guess so. The, so, um, I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean, I I guess if you have so if you have these you know twelve or whatever points I gave here, well, nine and some corollaries. Um, I don't have a reason to think that if you have excitement, if you have open debate, if you have all these things in the project that people naturally fall, as you bring in new people, they naturally fall into different, different buckets. And you have people who are very meticulous. Like you have uh, the, you know, you have the more math oriented computer programmer, right? Who's like, no, things need to be done in this exact sequence and you know, I've looked at this thing and it doesn't really work. Those people are really great for reviewing patches because they kick things out, they say like, you know what, this is a great idea, but it's, you know, we need to open it up for debate because I'm not sure that it, it works right now. And that over time, you get more of those people if you foster them coming into your community. So, I mean, this is a great example of a problem I hope I have, right? You, I'd love to have this problem of like, there's so many contributors, what am I gonna do? Ah! You know, like pulling my hair out with contributors. You know, that's like a, that's a problem you love to have because so few people get to have that problem of saying like, how do we do it? You know, maybe we go, you know, maybe the Linux model is used. The Linux model is for the most part where you have subsection, um, generals, basically, where they get, they handle their regiment. You know, people contribute back to them for their subsection and that they review and then over time they push things, you know, one level up, right? So basically that's a, you've, you introduce a very normal tiered approach for organization that we've had since like 1780, right? I mean, this is, none of this in terms of organizational, especially human-wise, is new, yeah. 700 BC, whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's my answer. So um, I am going to give it over to Ezra. Thank you, everybody.